Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Thelma Golden, Director and Chief Curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem. Thrilled to be here um, as part of the summit moderating this panel, Museums of the Future. Now, as a museum director, I've often been in conversations about museums of the present. It is the full sense of my work. But the potential today we have is to talk about what the museum is and will mean in the future, what form it will take, how it will understand itself in a changing world, and quite potentially with this amazing panel that's been assembled here today, to think about the implications and the possibilities for museums. Now, all three of my panelists have amazing bios full of incredible experiences, which I will ask you to look in your program to read. And very simply, well, I will introduce them as Adam Lerner to my left, Jan Peel, and Moisha Softy at the end all here to think through this idea and we want to open it up to you. But I'm going to begin because I think what we all have experienced in this last uh, day or so that we have been here is really the magic of this space of this museum, of its incredible sense of wanting to imagine the museum as an entity very differently, and also the exhibition on view, which really challenges these ideas of how we understand art now. So I thought a very important place for us to start, and a real privilege that we have, is having Mr. Softy here to talk about, to begin us with this museum, that you created and designed in the present, but clearly we're thinking about the implications of the future. And would you tell us a little bit about both the inspiration and what you hope the experience will tell us about what the museum is and means? So what I'd like to do is, I made thinking about this panel, just checkpoints. What, I th what do I think the museum of the future ought to involve? And I wrote community. Uh, expand the traditional role of museums from exhibitry and galleries to all kinds of activities. I wrote extroversion, a building that's extrovert. That means it reaches out, it's inviting. I wrote choose a site carefully, and that's about two things, access and magic. And then, of course, there is a question of the ultimate test, this question is the architecture overwhelming the collection? Uh, should, the uh, should the architecture uh, submit to the collection? So I'll, I'll just touch on those as I speak about this place because Crystal Bridges began with a question where to build it. I mean, there's a fairy tale how I got selected by Alice. Uh, no competition. She visited various projects of various architects. I came here for the day. We walked the site. There was a stream going right through here, wooded. Uh, we looked at the top of the hill. We looked at other sites as well. And then I felt we should do it here, right at the bottom of the valley. Of course, this being the stream bed, that meant the Corps of Engineers. That meant the flood plains. That meant f building a building for the 100-year flood. Then it became the 1,000-year flood. It's actually designed for the 3,000-year flood. But it was about creating a place. So the first idea was let's dam the stream and create these ponds. Let's not build a singular building, but a series of pavilions that surround the ponds. Uh, doing it low meant that the escarpment of the trees would always surround us. Um, and this was walkable to, I smile when I say it, downtown Bentonville. Not really down, uh, downtown, but downtown Bentonville. I mean, when I lecture about it in Hong Kong, for example, I say downtown Bentonville, and I warn them it's not downtown as they <laughs> understand it. And this was the genesis of the idea. Now, the building extrovert. I felt the building should be transparent and inviting, but this building has a mystery. When you arrive by car, like a regular visitor, there's just the hill, you just see a little, uh, the gate, the sort of, trellis wall that welcomes you, and then you discover it as you come down. And I thought that sense of surprise would give this place an intimacy. Now, one of the toughest things in museums as they get bigger and bigger, and you know, I've, like the National Gallery of Canada was like as big as a mat. How do you maintain a sense of legibility? How do you maintain a sense of intimacy? 
I mean, you're part of a sort of the ritual of experiencing culture in a ritualistic way at the same time that there's a need for intimacy. And I suppose the most uh, fascinating questions are the intangibles. This question about does the architecture overwhelm the art or uh, should the architecture submit to the art, I think is misplaced. It's a misplaced question. Because I think ideally, the architecture and the art or the collection, any collection, should completely resonate. They should, they should resonate with each other so that, to me, the ultimate test of a museum is remove the collection, remove the art, the place should be diminished. But equally so, remove the architecture, the experience of enjoying the art should be diminished. And if I think one achieves that, I think that's the right balance. And that's easy said, easily said than done. There are many other things about this building. I would talk about light. Light as the key, notwithstanding the conservers, notwithstanding the curators. I'm saying it loud and clear because this was a big debate here. Light is the key to a kind of a sense of well-being. Daylight, I mean, I don't mean artificial light. To a sense of well-being, to the metaphor of garden. I want to refer to one more experience that we had in conceiving of this place, which was a trip we made to Copenhagen. Uh, from the beginning, we talked about this museum being in this location and with a collection of American art which is heavy on landscape, that here was an opportunity to enjoy art and nature as kind of an intertwined experience. But what do we mean by that? And we went to visit the Louisiana Museum outside Copenhagen, which is a series of dispersed pavilions, the seashore, beautiful site, and you actually move from building to building outdoors and Alice and I came back with a kind of a conviction that here was the place to do it. And if you uh, have done the circuit, you will notice that after each gallery, you come to a spot where nature opens up. Uh, ideally, you'd go outdoors, and in fact, people can go outdoors and come indoor again. And so this intertwining of nature and the building, I think, is perhaps the thing that gives us the most pleasure here, apart from the great collection that the place has. Adam, as, <laughs> as director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, you've been involved in a singular project to kind of redefine the space of the museum, its activity, its understanding, even to your title. Uh, you refer to yourself as the chief animator of the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver. Can you talk about this project, your institution, as it relates to the future of museums and how you feel you are predicting perhaps what the museum is and should be. All right, thank you for the opportunity to do so. Um, and just first of all, uh, on my title, um, so traditionally the role of somebody in my place would be director and chief curator. Um, and, but when I, which is right, the, was your, your title, that's the sort of normal thing. But it, what I thought was, um, okay, what does a curator do? A curator, like, Traditionally, a curator cares for objects. Curator and care have a root similarity. Um, and, and I thought that, well, what I want to do is not so much care for the object, but I want to bring it to, bring the object to life, bring art to life for visitors. That's why I want to animate the space, animate the art for my visitors. And I think that, um, so therefore I said, well, I don't want to be a curator, I want to be an animator. Interestingly enough, when I, um, of course, by the way, like I want to say, like, that's completely irritating to actual animators to have that, that title. They're like, yo, um, and I get a lot of mail for like animation <laughs> associated. Anyway, but it's my problem, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, but I, 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 okay, so the reason why people associate um, what I do with sort of um, the future of museums is I tend to do things a little bit differently. Um, like, so for example, my flagship program that I've been running for now 10 years has been a program where, um, as a lecture series, that um, involves two speakers instead of just one. So you invite one, you invite one speaker to speak on one subject, say Walt Whitman, for a half an hour. Then you have a second speaker speak on a completely unrelated subject for half an hour, say 
whole hog cooking. And then you have question answer on both at the same time. And it'd be like tequila and dark matter in the universe. You know, you have like a leading expert on tequila and how to make tequila. You have a leading expert on like, you know, black holes. Talk about dark matter. And then you and then, and then you find these associations in the question answer. And, and and this is a program that I've been doing where you know, it just sort of stands for everything that I believe in. But we also do things like we'll have um, a program called Art Meets Beast where we take a bison that had been slaughtered just a few weeks before from a ranch not too far from us and we um, butcher it, you know, artisan butcher it, uh, artisan butcher will butcher it in the gallery space um, in front of an audience and talking about the parts of the animal and then um, over the course of three days, we talk about and have workshops on the relationship between art and food and then we have a feast where all the leading chefs in the city will have taken parts of this bison and we eat the bison together. Um, and so that is about, so in addition to having exhibitions by you know, very you know, important emerging and established artists like Rashid Johnson or you know, Tatiana Blas, we would also do these kinds of, um, I don't know, eccentric programming. And, and for me, like, it's not about like, trying to make things more accessible it's about, well, to me, it's just more interesting on some level. Um, so therefore, when we you know, you know, have this program where we butcher a bison, to me, I'm not saying that that is art, but I'm saying it is doing what art aims to do, and what art aims to do always is to help us see the world with fresh eyes. And, and therefore, I'm interested for my museum in how do I connect the traditions of art and art history that have been going on for, you know, that, we, that we've inherited with the title museum in the DNA of our institution, how do we connect that tradition to what I think of as the vibrancy of a city? Like the, the sort of the, the, the energy of development, the energy of like kids, you know, doing um, a zombie crawl through the center of the streets, the, the, the energy of people doing sort of mass bicycle rides, and how does a museum, which is generally a rear guard institution connect to what makes cities interesting. Mm -hmm. And so that's what interests me. But I want to say this, is that even though that is what I do in my institution, I don't, I don't think of it as the future. Mm -hmm. I just think of it as that's what interests me for this place. And, you know, I think I, I, I don't like the idea of it being like, um, the, a model, I think that every institution develops its own model. Like what makes Crystal Bridges so amazing, what makes state of the art so amazing, is not that it's sort of an innovation and therefore like the future, but it's authentically for this place, it's authentic. And that's actually what all creativity for me is, is, is wiping away the conventions that determine how we should do things to clear those away and sort of do things that feel like you know, creative and authentic to who you are. Exactly. Liana, in your leadership of Intelligence Squared, you've been involved completely in the information economy, but also in your involvement in kind of radical new forms of philanthropy internationally, you've been disruptive in some ways within the space of museums and how they work. Can you talk about this idea of your own experience and how it will relate to a future, particularly in the international context where we see the idea of the museum in places where this is a new con construct, right, or a, a, a forming construct in, in ways that are different than our own, but also how you've understood it in those institutions you've been a part of changing? Well, thank you, Thelma. Thank you for the opportunity for letting me share my passion for reaching unprecedented audiences in innovative ways. Um, I think when I look back, uh, my start in the arts was after leaving banking, starting an art foundation, which at the time seemed really innovative in terms of bringing audiences together to support public art. But now I look back and think it was a really Luddite Kickstarter. So what we did very manually was over five years of very arduous labor, gather together a um, hundred people who would give us this five million pounds at the time. What Kickstarter has done in five years is gather five million people that have given one billion dollars to the arts. And I think the lesson for me there was of course that there's such an important lesson in the terms of high touch philanthropy and development and the privilege of being in the museum. But my work at Intelligence Squared 
showed me that the thousand person audiences we thought were really huge for this kind of gathering of improbable pairings, for example, could actually be amplified so many times over when we put that debate with Christopher Hitchens and Stephen Fry and Dawkins online and suddenly had two million podcast downloads from people who would never pay 25 pounds to actually be at the Royal Geographic Society to listen to that debate. So as I started on this path with Intelligence Squared of moving to Hong Kong and recognizing how far I was from some of the greatest centers of excellence, the way I started to both attend our debates virtually and to engage with Tate and V&A and Met and other museums virtually was through this artery that I developed. And I realized that what we were doing in amplifying our message with Intelligence Squared via podcasts and YouTube and Twitter and anything available to us really was also something that we could use to replicate this experience to museums. Um, that made me somewhat uh, an agitator as I made my way back to London and would knock on the door of Nick Sirota and say, we need to put all this online. We need to do all these different things. And yet what we ended up launching last week, which was about a year in and a real labor of love, was one small example. It was Tate coming online to Khan Academy and going to a platform that's already delivered 300 million lessons online. And so as I look to what we're doing with Intelligence Squared in terms of going out to nine cities, having live audiences, I'm realizing that's actually the privileged uh, offering of those who can be in those, but we're always gonna have a multiple of people who can access us for free that might never step into uh, you know, a convention center in Chile or into uh, an auditorium at Lincoln Center. So in conclusion, I think what's really interesting is embracing the new technology never as a way to disintermediate the museum because it's really hard to eat a bison as a community on Kickstarter. <laughs> um, but really just to look at what tools are available to us to re reach these unprecedented audiences in unprecedented ways and to look at the fact that, okay, Tate now has 7 million people visiting and 14 million people visiting online, but Met has a multiple of six times the physical football online, football online. The irony being that actually more people visit arts institutions in the UK than football matches. Right. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you reverse that? So it seems that in many ways when we talk about the future, there are many things to talk about, but one of them is this role of technology, right? And what we all probably feel as the desire to completely always privilege the live experience with the work of art, but want the tools that sort of open that to wider audiences. And then the other is this idea of access, right? Who, who comes to museums, how they get there, literally, and what the experience is when they are there. Any thoughts about how we begin to bring together what both is what we imagine as the present and our best ideas of how our institutions in the most site-specific ways might operate with the tools that we have at our disposal to really open up this dialogue to wider audiences. Where is, where is the balance? Where can it be? I'm giving that to all three of you, because I know. Your, that's your platform, your technology. So why don't you start with, why don't we start with you? Uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, Sorry. posing yeah, in that there. space today. No, no, but it's, it's, really, it's really terrific because as I mentioned for five years living in Hong Kong, the message has so often been about the bigness of spaces. Mm -hmm. So it's been about build it and they will come, focusing on the hardware instead of the software. So as a very brief suggestion, it's this idea that the bigness of the spaces can also be in the bigness of the ideas. So really, how do you take the best curators, the best messages, and take this tiny art space that I chair called Parasite, which would fit into this box, mm -hmm. and really put on the kinds of exhibitions that are worthy of global coverage, it all comes back to the quality of the curation, but also figuring out how to address the audiences and the patrons and the media that are not in your physical domain. Mm -hmm. I find the discussion a bit reminiscent of a similar discussion that occurred about libraries. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the word was out, libraries are over. Uh, because of access, uh, research, anything we need, uh, who needs them anymore? Mm -hmm. And that just about was at the beginning of the prolification, biggest prolification of uh, urban uh, public libraries that the country's seen in, in decades. Libraries are getting built everywhere. And they have a new role, changing role. Uh, they're packing the books and sending them to storage, a lot of them. 
They're accessible if needed, but they're completely new institutions. They're about happening, about people wanting to partake in a certain uh, experience and access and, and, and lessons and education. And, and I think the same is true of the museum. The more that happens virtually, the more that happens in the air, the more we can pick up on our screen, the more our appetite is wet and we're then needy. And all this needs place. And, you know, forget about what that place will be. We, we don't know quite what that museum of the future is physically. But I am convinced that we need place, and that place needs to be a place that's conducive to all these things we want to do, not alone, but as a group, as a community. So whatever the form this museum takes as it evolves, I think the need for it will be as urgent, if not more urgent, than it's ever been in the past. We have a hunger for it. Um, so I think that the, the thing that technology creates more than anything else is a certain kind of person. And that is a person, a kind of person who uses technology. And I think that's, for me, the biggest um, sort of factor to deal with is um, the kind of new human being that is you know, raised on technology much more so than ever before, um, that sees sort of part, their own creative involvement and participation in the world. So I think for me, like one of the most sort of heartwarming experiences that I have had is when I learned of this whole generation of kids who were making copycat videos of say the Call Me Maybe you know, video. They're all like, and like okay, so, so like all these YouTube you know, videos were emerging of kids doing that and I thought, you go, you go kids. Like you are so much better than we were. Like, you are creators, you are makers. And like, so it's not surprising to me when in Denver, there was a survey, a, um, a statistically significant survey, telephone survey um, that took place um, just last year. And it was basically asking, it was related to the arts. And it was developing a plan for the city of the arts in the 21st century. And over half of the people under 25 years old describe themselves as artists. 53% of people under 25, and then it goes down and down and down as you get older. Um, and so, I, and I thought, yeah, if you're making your own YouTube video, you are, in a way, an artist. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so therefore, like, what is the role of art in a world of artists? Mm -hmm. What is the role of a museum? And I think in, 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 in the world where everybody can actually be producers, and I think that that's where, where we come in to be like, when we, when we create a program where we do like a program called like, um, according to the internet, where we have an expert come and talk, but we don't ask them, like we have an expert on Freud talk, but we don't ask them questions about Freud. I mean, what, the truth of what Freud did, we ask them, well, like what like, people on the internet would, said, like, so which, is it true that, and then ask them that to tell us like what the internet says about Freud is true. And um, that's just the program we have, but it, it feels DIY. It feels like it's connecting to that DIY spirit that's in the city, and that's what interests me more than anything else about technology, much more than its ability to interpret the physical object is, is this person it creates. But that's perhaps one of the greatest questions, right? And that is this role that museums have as collecting institutions. And there are many people who position that our roles in museums will move from being about collections to being about programs, right? And the relationship of objects and how they live in the world can possibly change. So everyone's going to be an animator now? Well, potentially, <laughs> or that, or a curator, because yeah. also we certainly get annoyed in the world when people are curators of wine and curators of their shoes, right? As opposed to curators of art. But that's, a, that's an aside. But this idea of the, the collection, you know, I mean, Moisha, you talked about this idea of creating a physical space for the art. Right? And we all know that's what creates an amazing experience for art. But there's also a whole realm of museums that are being created now explicitly without collections. I don't. Yeah. I mean, we designed a, a museum in Singapore as part of a complex. It was really, I called it the casino tax. The developer had to build a cultural institution. And so we try, I tried to figure out what, you know, Singapore has an art museum and it's got a historic museum. And we invented something called the Art Science Museum. 
and I've been watching it now for three years. The idea was that by trying to have an institution committed to bringing the arts and the sciences somehow juxtaposed together, that this would open up a whole new world of possible exhibitions. In fact, it has. But I've also seen uh, an exhibition there, a Van Gogh exhibition, galleries which are very tall, 20 feet tall, with a whole series of walls projecting the paintings, including close-ups, on the floor, on all the walls, uh, in an area twice the size of this gallery. And I saw hundreds of people in, in wonderment taking in Van Gogh like, like maybe they never have before. And so here, no collection at all. And the critics were very critical. What's the point of doing projected Van Gogh? I actually got such a high out of it just watching the kids lying on the floor and you know, going crazy. Uh, so definitely collection is uh, opened up. But also I think subject matter. I mean, you allude to that subject matter. I mean, the, the bison slaughtering is a ritual. It's, a, it's an anatomy lesson. Uh, you can go on to talk about the chemistry of it and of course the gastronomy of it and the culture of gastronomy and, and, and endless. So opening up the subject matter in a much more uh, free and interpretive way, I think has the potential of drawing a public that museums, art museums, don't have today. And I think it also brings this question of art museums always forming, in a way, their sense of themselves and their mission around being authoritative, right? We, the purveyors of this knowledge. And what we understand now is that our best use often is to create a space for audiences to bring their own knowledge with them and meet the knowledge that we have as institutions through the works of art. What do you think, Jana, in terms of this idea of institutions as sort of knowledge spaces, how that transforms our experience of them. Well, I'd love to pick up on this idea of the library. I'm spending a lot of time at Yale this year, and I had prided myself on not having gone to the library for several months because everything that I needed was on Oracle. Of course, when I finally made my way to the library, it was because Tom Stoppard was coming and he was going to be discussing Arcadia, and I made my way to the library for the 4.30 talk, and the queue went around the building because, of course, everybody wanted to be in a physical space with Tom Stoppard in a community where they could question and discuss. So as you say, I think the building is paramount to those who can get that access, and whether you're carving a bison or hearing a great author or having a completely improbable pairing or heated discussion, I think the building is first and foremost that center of discourse and discussion. What I'm seeing a lot of in Asia particularly where the private collections are the ones that are getting the biggest building and the biggest tax breaks and the biggest ribbon cutting ceremonies um, is also just this need to really ensure that the kind of education that is in the DNA of American institutions when they open the doors to these buildings is also that's something that's ingrained. So I guess there I would say apart from the building it's also the very clever collaborations that need to ensure that the extension can really you know, do what the Met is doing, or rather the British Museum is doing with Minecraft, for example, or go into places through these kinds of discussions that start in the museum, but also take the discussion well, well beyond. And I think that participation is often um, misused in our field as, like, you know, it happens, I guess, in every field that there's like a, a word that people like cling to as the next thing, and everyone's like, oh, we've got to do that, and then they sort of do it unthinkingly, which is to me not really innovative, and it's true sense. I think that f for me when I think about what is participation, um, like I think it's you need to participate as a creator, as an institution. That's what we do. We, we attempt to sort of participate in the creative voices of the city, of what makes a place interesting. Um, and th that doesn't mean that when, when somebody is in front of a work of art, they have to somehow like have a constructed opportunity to somehow respond to it because online they reply and so therefore we have to provide them with a means of replying to a painting. Well, I think that people will find their own ways of replying, the, me the mechanisms are out there, but what you really need to do is you need to allow them to sort of feel like you, um, that, that the participation uh, that you have in the city is a little bit more like um, when they hear their friends perform in a band it's not like they say, okay, we want to participate now, we want to go up on stage. Like, no, but the idea is that you can create your own band or you create your own event 
and, and the, the feeling that you are participating within the life of what makes a place interesting, that's what matters to me. And it would seem that in the participation also is what creates some relevance for um, institutions in their place, in their specific place, but also in their place within the sort of evolving art history. Uh, one of the amazing things about seeing this exhibition is that it does upend our ideas about an idea of how we defined even the regional structure. I don't think talking about regionalism in contemporary art is even that effective anymore, right? Because we know there are all modes of practice happening in many different places and their sense of definition often comes from very specifically where they're from and who they're from. But when you match that to the mission that many institutions have, you really do open up this whole idea of how institutions become relevant, either when they're formed or stay relevant when they are hundreds of years old. What, what would be, for any of you, the most important aspect uh, of a museum's life that makes it relevant in its present, but also predicts some relevance along in the future? I mean, I think, it, as I said, it's authenticity. Mm. I mean, I, th and I, think, I think people can smell that. Um, like, we don't have even a marketing budget, but our programs, mm -hmm. they sell out at 250 people a night. Mm -hmm. We don't even, not even, there's not, no one even in charge of marketing. Mm -hmm. And we just, there's a gravitational pull mm -hmm. that things have when, they're, when they have an authenticity to them. And that's where the gravitate. obviously there's probably a marketing budget for Crystal Bridges, I'm guessing. But, um, like, but we're really small, we're like 30,000 square feet, two, two and a half million dollar budget. So we're about a tenth of the side probably of this museum. But, um, but to me, like, what is, how are you in, um, a source of gravity that draws people, that matters? It's an uncensored platform for artists to really uh, offer their messages. And I think censorship can mean many things. It meant one thing when I was living on the doorstep of China, but censorship can also come in terms of compromise or pandering uh, to the different interests that I think we all know often find their way into the politics of a museum. So for me, the greatest luxury uh, and, and, and the greatest messaging is really when you create that white space for artists to create. Mm -hmm. To me, the question is one of specificity. So in a sense, I think there's no answer to your question because museums are so very diverse and their success has to do with how they respond. For example, a national gallery. National gallery has an archival role, conservation role. It disseminates that to, to different cities and regions and states. It's fundamentally different from a museum such as this, which is a regional community museum, and so on and so forth. So there's, there are so many different roles, depending also on collections or no collections, depending on resources, depending on the local culture, that the real, at least for, I, I speak, you know, I'm only an architect, so it's about the physical plant at the end that I sort of focus on. And that physical plant, needs to be highly, t specifically tailored to, the, to what the institution, the place, the culture uh, is. And the success, therefore, is to do with the, the, the extent to which you've captured that specificity, the specificity of the site. Right. I wouldn't do this you know, on Fifth Avenue. Uh, I'd do something else, I think. And it has to do with just how specific you can get and therefore, your, your response as an architect is very particular rather than general. You know, it's funny because I th think to your point, people tend to think about museums like they think about hospitals. Right. Like we all should have the same sort of like, up to, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, oh, you need like up to the date mechanisms for, you know, whatever, interpreting art or whatever. But actually they're more like restaurants mm -hmm. where like, you know, you want sometimes the quick bite and sometimes you want the like really slow, long artisanal meal, you know, this, uh, there should be a wide range, and I think that you're more advanced than I think museum professionals are, because I think the museum field still thinks of itself in some levels as, like, still thinks of the museum as a thing that everybody should be, a single thing. But I think it's, it should be, like, a, we should be allowing a much more variety. So it brings me to the problem of the moment, which is the word, the wow effect. If I hear that once more, you know? <laughs> you work and you work and you try and figure it out and then the question is, where's the wow? Where's the wow? And you know, that's actually tells us something about the sort of short-lived uh, instant gratification 
that is, that's diverting a lot of energy in museum design today. Well, look at the Louisiana Museum, which I'm sure so many people here would reference as their favorite museum in the world, even though it lacks that overt wow moment that Edwin Heathcote might have on the cover of the FT. And so it's interesting that now moment or that wow moment sometimes is also embedded in, you know, Walter Benjamin's idea of yet sight, the pregnant moment. It catches something that it's is so timeless. specific the to the time of space right here, right now. I mean, and, okay, so we talk about the museums of the future then. Like, you think about um, how it is that um, evolution works so that things that are, you know, evolutionarily more, sort of like earlier, evolutionarily earlier, are, like exist alongside things that are later, and that's great. Like it seems to work well to have that because, you know, I think it's great that we still have living cathedrals. And people say to me like, how do we make, like all the time I get invited, like you, you, people look to me one or two ways. Like they're like either like the destruction of the museums, Adam, <laughs> or they're like the future of museums, Adam. And, I, and, I, and I, I guess I would say like, no, no, I'm not trying to make the big claim. I, and I feel like people say to me, they'll, 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 like, we've got this really boring museum. And I say, that's great. Mm -hmm. That is great. You should, like, if you've got a museum that no one goes to, I want to go there because that sounds like an amazing experience to go to a museum that nobody goes to. And, <laughs> and I, I wish, I wish that, that, that some museums, that some museums would have the courage in 2014 to say that. Like, you know, we want to be the kind of place that nobody goes to. I wish there was somebody who says that because, like, because that's not me. Right. But I wish that that is. The question is who's going to pay for that? Right. So sometimes you get into these issues of funding, which is so charming and wonderful right. when you have this historical moment embalmed in the past, yes. right? So while we can also sit here and have the luxury of saying, isn't that great, that fantastic museum of artifact that's visited by 72 people, I think there's also just this reality that we have to address, which is without compromise, how do you also create something that's so interesting to Adam, but also perhaps to a broader audience to create a sustainability, unless you have a wonderful patron that really sees the benefit in that. I love now being associated with like the totally traditional, like boring institution. That's fantastic for a change. Thank you. So, but but I think that that really raises the question about what is the institutional sort of mechanism for for sustaining the institute, like uh, our museum. So like so therefore, um, like how how do we how do we live? Like our institution, it's hard for us to make our budget every year. Like and, it, and other museums are very well capitalized, and we've got different kinds of abilities to do things given our budget and different kinds of freedom to do things. And I think that um, th what I worry about is that, that one of the mechanisms that holds museums back is, of course, the structure of how they're funded. And I think that there's a tradition that the, the concept of philanthropy is still in our country associated with a culture around the traditional museum. And therefore, if we want to invent a new kind of museum, I think that there should be museums that are, you know, like there should be a museum out there that's also a dance club. Like, and it's just all video art and people are just dancing to the video art. And that's, Can somebody should write it. Board? Yeah, wouldn't that be fun? But like, but you're never gonna get a philanthropist <laughs> to fund that because it doesn't smell like sure. a museum. It doesn't smell the kind of thing you give money to, even though that's in some ways the museum of the future. And so therefore, we have a disjunct between the, the programmatic development of museums and the philanthropic culture. But philanthropy will change too. There's the young kids who have a billion dollars and they might just want to do what you want to do. And the museums, I don't, think, don't. are challenging the idea. The article in the New York Times, does anyone here speak art and tech? And there was a suggestion that ne'er the two worlds shall meet, they're not interested in each other, and Eric Schmidt just doesn't see the beauty in standing in front of Mark Rothko's red, so he's not going to catch that moment. He needs to pixelate it down to a gazillion pixels, and then he can see what art is really about. But I think just to challenge also, the museums need to shift their mindset of who is their new patron. So the idea, although it takes a lot more work, to think what kind of questions, the entrepreneur that Moshe refers to, what question do you want challenged? So when we came to Tate and said, what do you guys need? They said, oh, we'd like, you know, $10 million. We said, what are you gonna do with that? And so you answer a question, we need to do X, Y, and Z. So just in a nutshell, I also think there's a bit of a rethink. Where are you gonna find that person that really loves to dance and also really loves the art? How do you reach out to a new community of engaged donors who really want to do things other than potentially build buildings or put art on the walls. Okay, so, yeah. You also have a lot to say about this, but I'm like, do you want to answer it? No, I'm moderating. Okay. So, <laughs> um, but as moderator, what I would say to that is perhaps where that brings us is this idea that while we know the future of museums is dependent on creating new audiences, 
It means widening our audiences, having them more reflect the demographics in this country of the country that we are and are becoming. But it also, to your point, is about us expanding our notion of philanthropy and creating a different idea of a philanthropic structure, which exactly as you say, Adam, sees what it is to be the museum you are imagining and understands it as museum, not as not a museum, because their definition of what a museum is, is formed through experience. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's true. I think that um, there is, you can't just simply take the, uh, a totally new thing and say, oh, well, let's take the old sort of philanthropy model. Like, I, I think that when I, talk to, um, like, like, I can always get people to fund our um, certain kinds of programs that are the more traditional programs, but I've got, for example, there's somebody in Denver who is a major, major patron of the arts who comes to our mixed taste, as we call when we pair those unrelated topics, right, like every single, um, almost, almost every single week she's there, and she pays her $10, and we ask her for support. And for her, it's so relevant to her life that she couldn't even conceive that we would actually need money to support it. It's like, it's like the movies. It's like you don't give money to the movies. I mean, you give, them, you give them money when you pay for your ticket. Why do you have to give them money? That's what it means to be relevant, is to not get extra money. That's what relevance is. And so that's, like, like, like McDonald's is really relevant. And, and I think that, and, so they're, and they're not asking for philanthropy. So I think that, so I really think that those questions are, are super questions, but what I find I'm getting a lot of is like, Okay, so I'm, I'm um, I think of what we do as a lot of as like a laboratory space. Like we are clearly just inventing programming, inventing materials. And I would say that that makes sense why a lot of companies, when we ask them for support, they say, okay, well, why don't you come in and work with our staff? And like that's what they're interested in is that they say like, what we really want is we want creativity workshops. We want innovation workshops for our staff. And so we're starting to learn that actually like maybe they're, like that's telling us what the new model is. It's not sort of taking the old model of philanthropy, they're actually taking of. But how great that philanthropy is not aid, so it becomes a more engaged and sustainable model potentially. Yeah, and I think that, we, but, but the, our issue is that we still have the idea of a museum and therefore like, so therefore like, if I were to do everything as, pay, as fee for service, then that's like, I don't, I simply, my, the structure of my job would have to change because I'd have to be more like an architecture firm you know, which is more fee for service. And I think that like, but the model of the museum director doesn't quite allow so for that. So it really brings us, and I do want to open this up to you all, because I hope there are some questions for this amazing, these three. But it really brings up then, finally, where I'll ask you all to respond. And when we think about this space of innovation, the one that our culture is deeply invested in, what's the role of museums in the innovation culture? What are museums and what can they be? I'm gonna start with you. I think I don't really have an answer because I think, you know, we live in the present and uh, I suppose what a museum will evolve to be is a big question mark. It's, uh, it's the art not yet created in the ways not yet available uh, to be used in a way we can't yet imagine. So it means let's just be open, you know? Uh, and if I'm around, I'd love to explore it. <laughs> <laughs> Adam? Yeah, um, I feel like, I, I, by the way, I, I, I think that these challenges are, for me, what makes it all interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I, I like being in this sort of space that's halfway between the sort of, just this, you know, um, startup in a, you're still working out of a coffee house and being in a, you know, traditional art museum. Like, we combine both and that means we draw the benefits of both and also draw the, um, you know, there's disadvantages of that. And to me, like this to tension I'm describing to you is like a very fruitful tension to like to explore because you, we believe, I say like, I, I care about gravity and also energy. And the museum needs to be both for, uh, for me. Like it has to be about the gravitas of a tradition, but also the energy of innovation and experimentation. I think for me they are the laboratories, the think tanks, and the catalysts that will present the big questions of our day. It's great if they get answered in those physical spaces, but equally they can resonate around the world and a little beyond. Fantastic. Are there any of you here who would love to ask a question? I think there are microphones or maybe, yes. 
So we'll start in the back uh, and come. Yes, you know, uh, you spoke about a museum that had no art collection, but used the visual technology to do it. Do you see uh, the museums, one thing that has always concerned me is, particularly the major museums, is in their stacks they have such wonderful art that never sees the light of day mm -hmm. for decades. Mm -hmm. What about the idea of, uh, at, particularly as the resolution and the pixels have gotten more intense and, and better images are, are going out there about either uh, to your membership or on a rental basis, right to the homes go where you can have, you know, the art presented and, and you can select what art you want and at least you're, you're, you can live with that art around you for a month or whatever mm -hmm. in, in a way of exposing your collection in a different way mm -hmm. to the community mm -hmm. or to the nation. Yeah, I, I definitely think there is potential there. You know, when I went to work at the Whitney as a curator in the middle 90s, it was the end of what was something that happened at the Whitney as well as many other museums, which is a rental collection. Right? which allowed people, and so many times people still will come up to me and say, you know, I lived with A, name the artist, name the work of art, through the rental collection. And it provided them with what we all know is the amazing experience of having the ability to see a work over time and to live with it and to have it be in your space, your mental and your physical space. And I do think what you're saying, those of us with collections that really are troubled by the idea of what it means to not have them fully accessible all the time, that figuring out within the complicated world of intellectual property and other things, how we might do something just as you propose to get more of this work out there in it's the an world. interesting idea from the BNA, if I may, which is that for uh, 2020, to regenerate the Olympic site and to move the BNA stores, which are now in Blythe House, to uh, this area of E20, and somehow to find a way for individuals to call up two million objects that they choose as if they were their own. Question, Mr. Tom. So uh, I was just thinking about two openings that I was at. One was a sparsely attended opening <clears throat> in which an artist told me, looked at me and said, this, the uh, museum is the only place where you can give away free beer and still nobody comes, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and then there was another opening, which actually was open engagement, the conference. It was held at the Queen's Museum. There was 1,100 people there. But on the same day, there was a World's Fair celebration in the park, Flushing Meadows Park, at 60,000 people. Mm -hmm. And artists turned to me and said, <clears throat> you know, it's all fine and good to have 1,100 people here, but when the kind of real world entertainment industry gets fired up, that's when you really have an audience. So this is kind of a question, and you know I'm sympathetic. There's a sympathetic question to Adam, which is, is there a line between art and entertainment? Mm -hmm. And is there uh, something you wouldn't do because it went over the line to entertainment? Um, yes, uh, is there anything I, I wouldn't do? And I think that's, for me, what interests me is always, um, like if everybody was doing, uh, if museums became entertainment, I would, I, my museum would be not that. Like, because I always care about the thing that is different, and in many ways I think that's actually almost the definition of art, is the difference from what is the norm. Um, and so, there is, like, okay, so for example, one exhibition I did was um, against the idea of conservation. Like, con like, like that we, we, we talk about, like, oh, we need to conserve energy. And I thought, you know, the things that I love most in the world, like, are excessive uses of energy, like mostly like art, right? Art is an excessive of energy beyond what you need. And so therefore the exhibition was called the, about glorious success. So I, I think that th that's what interests me. And I, I would say that um, I still am interested in the traditions of art. Um, what doesn't, and the traditions of exhibitions, and we do, like we are probably one of the few museums in the entire country that actually does peer reviewed catalog publication. So University of Minnesota and University of Illinois have published our books. These are serious scholarship. So like, I, I get accused half the time of being like populist and half the time of being overly intellectual. And, and I, I like that tension. <laughs> Question. Yes, Carol Auerbeck. 
This is a little bit off the wall in terms of a question, but Yana, you mentioned the you were uh, catalyst. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of all the children who are educated, I'll start with this country, mm -hmm. and our educational system that really has done not as much good as we would like it. I'm trying to be as positive as possible. But knowing that we have to start, we're looking into the future in terms of museums, but I'm looking a little bit backwards in terms of our teacher education, not even the children, because I think that we really are not doing a great job and have not been doing a great job about educating the educators who are going to be influencing uh, our children. Today has been phenomenal, and, and yesterday as well, in terms of creativity and the excitement and the possibilities. So is there a role, and what might that be for artists, for, for museums, to really work and I don't mean with individual schools necessarily, but I think we do need a larger picture in terms of working with the universities that are training our teachers to do a better job. We talked about the use of technology. I know too many teachers who will refuse to use it because they don't know how to. We just make an assumption, yes, our two-year-olds and three-year-olds know how to do it, but there are many teachers who are very uncomfortable still. And so where, does, where do museums and all of this excitement fit in. I think that's so interesting and on point. When MoMA launched its first massive open online course last summer, they did it about teaching the teachers. And so although that was a technological tool, what they found, I think, was that over five years of having the lessons that they sold in their bookshop in terms of the modules, I think they had about 3,500 uh, people who bought those. I think they got about 10,000 in the first week of having this massive open online course. And though many teachers did not finish the full module, the explanation to me was at the moment, Department of Education, a lot of people don't go through every room in our museum, but still, they have some kind of experience. So technology is not the answer, but I think it's interesting that educating the educators is definitely the direction that will achieve that kind of scale. And I think for um, an institution like mine, the Studio Museum in Harlem, from our founding, our commitment has been to educating educators in order to be agents in their classrooms to bring not just art, but culture as part of the conversation. And I think now the version of that in our life, 46 years after our founding, is really to take a radical look at where art can fit into these new ideas of curriculum. Um, which are being delivered uh, through technology, which are now having the potential to not just uh, educate the educators, but also parents, right, in their ability to help young people in the learning environment. We have time for one more question. I am sorry, oh my gosh. And the microphone is here, and I see the two of you over here, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Mary Ann Greenwood, and I'm having a little difficulty with the conversation in that I hear, what I'm hearing is that the future of art is experience, it is digital, and we're talking about programmatic things. And then with Mr. Softy, we have what I identify of museum as a space. And Crystal Bridges uh, is a piece of art. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a work of art. So is the future of the museum going to be not a, a work of art, but to be a repository or, or a file cabinet of videos or digital uh, representation? I, I'm, I'm having trouble making the future of museum as a place work with you know, I, I, and then I can see museum. I mean, I can see art as a program. Right. So, I, where I does like museum fit? Can I say yeah. something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I feel like Crystal Bridges to me is a machine that produces beautiful people. It produces the kind of people who love art, the kind of people who see art as part of their life, and they produce that through through art exhibitions, through gatherings, through all kinds of experiences that are educational. And for me, this is, this is a turbine. I kind of feel it turning in already. Um, and it's a turbine that is about creating meaning in people's lives. And, and I don't feel like you, there needs to be a distinction between whether or not you're do, or even a hierarchy, to whether you're doing that through exhibitions or through education or through even 
preserving art for future generations so that machine can keep on going? I, I think I disagree. Uh, because I've, I've walked around uh, just people watching in this place. Yeah. Uh, on weekends, on weekdays, families, three, four kids, it helps that it's free, but they hear all of them, and they are, I would guess, I would say pretty safely that they are not museum-going people, that they have not been in museums before. And I think it's the combination that, of what occurs here that brings them here. So yes, the architecture appeals and attracts, it's seductive, but this stuff going on here in the arts, and it's the combination that brings them here. And otherwise, they would not be at home looking at art in their laptop. They yeah. wouldn't be. But that's what I'm saying. I so, I, I feel like no, but, I, but therefore, I think the physical plant and the programming and the collection. To me, that's all the machine. That's, that's the, the synergy. Machine. Okay, so, yeah. okay. In, in that case, you machine. <laughs> machine the important. quickest quote, and I yeah. promise. Yeah. Um, when I asked Hans Ulrich Obrist uh, when we launched our, Marina, our season with Marina Bromwich last week, I said, what's the Museum of the Future to you? And I just had to write down this quote because it brings in these two ideas. And he said, uh, this eminent uh, curator who co-runs the Serpentine, the 19th century model of the museum is that of a great storehouse of culture and civilization embalmed in the historical past. And that made me quite sad. And I think a mausoleum is not, you know, a museum is not a mausoleum where art goes to die. And I think it's these kinds of amazing collaborations that really catalyze the fiery creativity. So and the combination is very exciting for and all. And I think in conclusion to your point, what you're feeling is really the question of the possibility, right? That all these factors we're speaking of, the program, the experience, the building, the access, the technology, are all what we have at our disposal in museums. And I believe that the Museum of the Future, both as manifested in the experiences we have now, but also, as Moisha said, the ones we can't yet imagine what will be are what are going to define it. And we have the privilege of examples like this in Crystal Bridges, which really take sort of where we are as a culture, but open up the possibility of a really transformative experience. And I think when we all think about what's important to us about museums and the experience of art, it is that point of inspiration and transformation. And what I think we all hope in our work is to be able to bring that to wide audiences in many ways, whether for the first time or the hundredth time in a way that really gives the sense of the value and the power of the experience of art. I want to thank my three panelists who've been here with me today. Thank you all for joining us.